Male aggression. It's fine when the gloves are on. It can get dangerous when it's directed at women. Why do you feel so entitled to a woman's body, to a woman's sexuality, that you will literally become violent towards her? But would this be as big a problem if so many others weren't acting as enablers? Of course, it's about men in particular using their power against women, but then also it's really about the people around them that kind of support it or silent around that. Our goal? To describe and define toxic masculinity. Dude, stop trying so hard. Podcaster Mark Pagan thinks men should drop the macho mask already. Meanwhile, he's trying to unlearn what he studied so hard as an adolescent. The way George Michael wore jeans, mouth snarling, men who wear loafers with no socks. To me, being a man was exotic because I was into things women were into, and I didn't know whether I could join the masculine club. I joined a different kind of club to learn more about the concept of consent. A lot of men, they don't know how to ask for what they want, and also they don't know how to understand a no. Will you kiss me? <laughs> no. Thank you for taking care of yourself. But with these folks, consent leads to one big cuddle. She's broke my cuddle barrier. <laughs> I'm safe here. This week on Going In, we're looking for an antidote to toxic masculinity. I know it when I see it. In 1964, when Associate Supreme Court Justice Potter Stewart wrote those words as part of his opinion on an obscenity case, he was trying to get at a universal definition of pornography. Nearly half a century later, we're grappling with behavior that also defies a universal definition, but some would argue is easy to spot on sight. Toxic masculinity. Here on Wall Street, this bull is the embodiment of strength, power, and aggression. Traits that build empires and bend the will of anyone in the way of the guy with the biggest horns. And you might be saying, damn right, what's wrong with that? This is when I'm gonna ask you to pause for a second before you start throwing bombs about men being men or flogging toxic femininity, whatever that is. Toxic masculinity is not something some angry East Coast feminist made up to make men feel inferior. It's a global scourge. In China, Xi Nan Nai literally translates into straight male cancer. But it's not just straight men who are the perpetrators of this particular performance of masculinity. At the beginning of the year, this image went viral around the gay world. And while the picture is worth a thousand words about toxic masculinity in queer spaces, it's also a gag. A tongue-in-cheek critique created by a few gays in the nightlife industry. And while the ad may be fake, the issues are very real in queer communities and beyond. Cat calling, intimate partner violence, mass shootings, fraternity hazing. The list goes on. Again. If you hear this as a critique, think of it as a loving one. And remember, men listen, think, and react accordingly with respect, and sometimes even in that order. So just rock with us for a minute and find out how Brooklynites are defining a problem while simultaneously working to solve it as we go in on toxic masculinity. Boys don't cry, man up. Our society generally rewards men for being smart and taking action, while relegating care and consideration to some lesser desired attributes of the feminine realm. 
But what if you're a young man immersed in the feminine and consider yourself hella evolved only to see some of the same patterns of the patriarchy at play in your own actions? What does toxic masculinity look like if you're one of the good guys? Hello, hello, hello. One, two, 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 two. Okay. Should be good. To me, being a man was exotic because I was into things women were into, and I didn't know whether I could join the masculine club. So I studied, in my own way. Around that time, my sister Lydia collected teen girl magazines, and I asked my grandmother if she could pick me up an extra copy of Tiger Beat and Bop when she went to the grocery store. Alone in my bedroom, I would create a chorus of voices in my head, with an ongoing study called Things I Like About Men. Some of these things included the way George Michael wore jeans, mouth snarling, just looking really disaffected, Sean Penn doing anything, men killing it in dance montages, men who wear loafers with no socks, pressing down on the accelerator, the act of opening a bottle for women, then they run their fingers through their hair because they're so psyched at how cool that was. This idea just built and built in my head, and after all this studying I had done, I couldn't wait to see what kind of stud I would be as an adult. As I talk to you right now, I'm 38 years old in good health. I have supportive friends, a fulfilling creative life. I've never gotten married, but I've had a lot of monogamous relationships with women. I've traveled. I can cook and pronounce empanadas con chorizo. I am told that I'm a great dancer, a good listener, and occasionally I will get someone informing me that her friend thought I was cute. For a single, straight guy, this is pretty good. And I am doing well on this masculine performance. But I'm a little heartbroken about what's behind the curtain. What really concerns me are the ways men try to mask their performance or what happens when they feel threatened or insecure. It's no longer on my wall. I see things in public and I want to shout, give this guy a f***ing hug or dude, stop trying so hard. I think it's George Orwell. He said something, I'm going to paraphrase it. He said something like autobiography is not to be trusted unless it can reveal something disgraceful. I was very scared to start this podcast for a lot of reasons, partly because it's really open and it's a season of me just acting as a case study for uh, masculine insecurity. And um, I was scared about how it would be interpreted. I, would, I was scared that I'm, I'm sitting here with coworkers right now who are going to see me on a day-to-day -day basis and know that, you know, I was threatened by uh, a handsome ex-boyfriend of my, my ex-girlfriend I feel like a lot of times men are, are holding it in. Um, and I, I don't think they're releasing it and or releasing it in the right way. And, in it, and maybe it comes out overly to a, a partner or to a family member. I'm, I'm very moved when I see men that uh, have a level of confidence and however they are in the world. And if they uh, feel affected by something, acknowledging it, um, to themselves or to whom they're with, or um, being okay with being called out um, for whatever it is, something they did wrong or even their performance. I think it's a really powerful model, and I, that, that does exist, but I think most of us are, are straddled with our performance, or our time and our performance. In 2014, the World Health Organization's first global report on suicide found men are three times more likely to commit suicide than women. A Movember Foundation poll in the UK found 50% of men over the age of 25 could not identify someone they would call a best or even close friend. 
It's one of the contributing factors to the 60% increase in male suicides over the last 45 years, a trend mental health professionals call a silent epidemic. As boys become men, their relationships change, but their need for connection doesn't. Intimacy can take many forms, but may be as simple as touch. But sometimes touch is anything but simple. So when we found out about a welcoming space to explore touch while learning respect for boundaries, we got on the cuddle list. May I kiss you? No. No. This is not the most awkward seduction ever captured on tape. It's a teachable moment. Oh yeah, I think we're shooting but before we go forward, let's go back. Back to my first cuddle party. Hello. Brian. Hey, Brian, can I give you a hug? Oh, cool. this is how it starts. <laughs> <laughs> Only if you want it. <laughs> For the unindoctrinated, a cuddle party is a social event where adults explore communication and boundaries through non-sexual touch. Everything that we do is built around this container of consent and boundaries. The concept of consent is something that feels very, like you said, airy-fairy. It feels very out there. But when you can put it in really practical terms, like asking for what you want and be able to hear no as an answer or yes, but let's do it this way as an answer. Taking care of yourself, right? So we're gonna do this back and forth a few times. So turn to the person next to you and say, may I kiss you? B, your job in this exercise is to say? No. Then A, your job is to look B straight in the eye again and say, thank you for taking care of yourself. No. <laughs> thank you for taking care no. of yourself. Thank you. Well, I think the biggest thing is when people say no or they're like, stop doing that. And then I say, thank you for taking care of yourself. It like nullifies the, yeah. that, that whole like no thing. But the first time someone outside of this space here, thank you for taking care of yourself. That has to be a like, what? Yeah. Like, what yeah. is that? What does that mean? <laughs> like, are you like starting shit with me? Or is that no, it's basically saying, it's like saying, I respect you and I see you and you taking care of your body is most important, more important than what I want. The hierarchy of want is neutralized by the exercise of consent, an exercise that can be empowered. But it's hard to teach an old dog new tricks. You know, they, they have a difficult time understanding, no. When, when I think of toxic masculinity, I think about men thinking that you owe them, you owe them something, right? That their expectations need to be met. That they're, they're not taking into consideration the other person, the woman, women's needs yeah. or wants. It's not just about men practicing consent. It's an opportunity for women to take agency over their bodies. I think part, a huge part of what this service offers is putting them in a situation where I get to say, no, actually, that's not comfortable. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, wait, okay, like what is comfortable? What's comfortable for both of us? What can we both enjoy? Can I go here? Yeah. Okay. Put my arm around you? Please. So what about, can I put my hand on your chest? Yes. So what about this like concept of toxic masculinity? What you need to be is comfortable with yourself. I think so. If you're, if you're okay with your masculinity, you, you won't have problems with another guy being close to you. So that's just the way I am. There's no way that a bunch of people laying around is gonna cure the Weinsteins of the world, or the O'Reillys, or the Trumps, and make them not be jerks. I beg to differ. I beg to differ, because I think there's not enough safe spaces mm -hmm. to discover what consent actually looks like, and what consent actually is. Because we teach communication, better communication skills and boundaries. Mm. Those are the two things that they really need to be able to improve their other relationships with women in general. I came into this because I believe that, that healthy touch is magic and medicine. When, when one person authentically sees another person, they see themselves. Now I know what it looks like from the outside, 
But if toxic masculinity has to be learned, can't consideration and respect be taught? And if they can be taught, why not start with something that seems as natural as contact? With context. Women's rights! Are human rights! 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 Women's rights! I think a lot of the abuse and the violence on women comes from this idea of what manhood is, what masculinity is. I think we're socialized to look at gender as two binaries, a man and a woman. This is how a woman is treated. This is how a man treats a woman. This is what it means to be a man. This is what it means to be a woman. And if we're socialized that way, then we're just gonna keep doing it as we get older and older and older. Street harassment, going outside, I'm feeling comfortable in my body and just having to cross the streets when I see folks um, that I know is going to say something to me. Oftentimes I don't want to leave my house just because I know there's still someone talking to me. It's just traumatizing and emotionally draining. It looks very differently every single day, but it happens every day. A lot of the pushback against my work comes from men who say, but there's nothing wrong with that, that it's a compliment. They really believe that this is how they are supposed to act towards women and that to push back against that is to be challenging the whole system. And it is a challenge to their manhood, it is a challenge to their masculinity because what they've been taught that masculinity is, is dangerous, it's violent. It is the reason why women are dying every day at the hands of men. Women are afraid to say no to men on the street. We're afraid to turn them down because they might literally kill us. Why? Why do you feel so entitled to a woman's body, to a woman's sexuality, that you will literally become violent towards her? There have been potential demographic changes in our country in which the traditional hegemonic white man um, is on course to be the demographic minority in this country. By 2025, white populations and white men won't be the dominant group. And so I think that there's a lot of anxiety around that issue. Part of the issue with the classic definition of toxic masculinity is that there's no other skill set other than acting out or acting aggressively. If you're anybody else in American society, if a person of color, a person who's deemed different by gender orientation, society tells you how to act. You can't walk down the street without being put in a particular box. And the illusion of toxic masculinity always is white men can kind of do whatever they want. The fear is going to be with that sense of authority and autonomy, white men really never develop skill sets in a toxic sense other than acting aggressively. I think the fear is that when they became the demographic minority, they might have to actually cooperate or collaborate with other kinds of people, which is an opportunity to make a better masculinity. But instead of that, what we're seeing is a lot of aggressive behavior. I can be like human and, and talk. <laughs> I don't have to worry about anything. It's just this is nice. The whole idea of what toxic masculinity and what role it's played in uh, the political climate and also the culture of violence that we live in. I wouldn't say that the, the presidency was like the main factor. It's something that existed, but really kind of put it out in the front. And it also kind of normalized the conversation around it and, and made it okay to demonstrate how you really feel and your attitude, particularly towards women. One candidate in particular kind of demonstrated uh, masculinity in, in multiple forms. A bullying behavior, name calling, and kind of really kind of playing on somebody's level of masculinity and how they kind of show up and present. So that kind of really sent a message that that's where America should be, right? It's probably a little bit more covert, but he made it overt, and so it really exacerbated the idea that it's okay to kind of speak this way and behave in this way. I think we, we're paying a price for it right now. The message that it sends to young people, and the message that it sends to adult men as well, you know, this is okay, if the president can do it, then we have license to do that as well. So I think it really sent a really negative message around what it means to be a man, and then also what it means to, you know, kind of survive and exist in, you know, in this present culture. I gotta use some Tic Tacs just in case they start kissing her. Now I'm automatically attracted to beautiful. I just start kissing them. It's like a magnet. I just kiss. I don't even wait. And when you're a star, they let you do it. You can do anything. Whatever you want. Grab them by the pussy. 
do anything. We're at a very interesting and obviously a very complex and often dangerous cultural moment. Part of the context, of course, is a presidential candidate who succeeded despite voicing some incredibly toxic um, beliefs about sex and gender and male power. I don't want to sound too much like a chauvinist, but when I come home and dinner's not ready, I go through the roof. It's the most salient right now for white masculinity because it's just the most public in, in relation to politics, mass shootings. This is a real moment of opportunity for white masculinity, not just to project and lash out, but also to rethink the ways that men act. This idea of machismo uh, that has been relatively similarly construed, this idea of being tough, of not paying attention to your own body, of acting in a way that on one hand is socially rewarding, uh, but on the other hand is um, is detrimental. We don't want to make a blanket kind of cultural assumptions about the ways cultures are, but white masculinity seems to be kind of in first place right now in terms of its, its toxic performativity. It's a toxic conversation that's happening. To get to a level of misogyny even being a problem, is, you know, can be tough sometimes. I don't think masculinity is, is automatically something that is, is, is negative, but it's something that definitely has to be uh, controlled and, and, and harnessed. I think toxic masculinity plays itself out in terms of um, being aggressive, you know, with women in general. What's really vital and important for people who are harassed is to be having conversations about our own resistance and how we can care for each other. Changing the dynamic of street harassment in a neighborhood also means that the people who do harassment have to stop doing it. And the conversation around how we organize men really does start with a conversation about masculinity because in a patriarchal society, masculinity is one of those things that it, it's so ubiquitous that men don't even know that they have it or that they do it. The other place where toxic masculinity is coming up quite a bit is in real acts of aggression like mass shootings where we're seeing a lot of male frustration that's linked not just to attitudes or behaviors but also about firearms. And it's a moment where I think masculinity has a choice. Does it want to become more collaborative and cooperative or does it want to lead down this toxic path that's going to lead to terrible ends for itself and for everyone else. And now we're really learning how it wasn't just the person that did the, uh, the sexual um, you know, violence. It's like, what about the, the environment that kind of protected or colluded with the person who was doing that? Of course, it's about men in particular using their power against women, but then also it's really about the people around them that kind of supported or silent around that. And that's who I'm really trying to target because I think they're the ones that can really make a difference in the future around um, these things from, from happening, right? It's really about holding people accountable, holding men accountable with compassion. A great first step is to have a conversation because so much of living in a patriarchal culture, so much of living in rape culture where it's okay for women to be harassed and sexually violated, is that oftentimes we're not having conversations about what this looks like. People who are harassed will walk around feeling really badly about an experience that they just had, and allies or view harassment will often not intercede and really don't even have conversations with men and other masculine of center people about what it looks like to intervene. So really the very first step is developing and creating an awareness. And then from there, I think folks will be really surprised at how generative a conversation is and how much can really come out of a conversation for how we need to be doing this work. You know, I don't know what it's gonna take to make men not be sexist or to not violate women or to not hold these ideas in their head that they are entitled to women. But I do think that a man can be sexist all he wants in his mind. But I think in order for us to change um, violence against women, we have to 
make it not okay for them to act these things out. Even though they may want to, even though they may still look at women as just sexual objects and don't really care about them or their feelings, maybe now they'll think twice about it because there will be consequences. When it comes to sexism and it comes to rape culture, it's like we have to call these dudes out. And I think that happens by telling our stories and calling for action. But I think we're witnessing this movement happen where women are just kind of becoming unafraid to say what it is that they've gone through. You don't have to be yelling at a woman down the street to still be sexist. You don't have to be grabbing women and abusing them to still have some part in it. Like you do, we all do. And you as a man living in a society that is misogynist, that is a patriarchal society, it's just, it's bound for you to have some sexism within you. You're just socialized that way. You just gotta step up. And yes, it's difficult. Yes, it's hard. Yes, it's uncomfortable, but you have to do it. You have to do the work. Thanks for going in with us on toxic masculinity. Remember, the first step to recovery is admitting that we've got a problem. If you want to watch this again or check out any past episodes of Going In, you can find us on the web at youtube.com slash booktv. Bye now.